we're going to talk about how to train a robot. And um, to the very left is Noel Sharkey, who's been working in robotics for a long, long, long time. Um, and in the recent years, he has focused on the ethics of robotics and uh, artificial intelligence, I guess. Um, so we want to touch a bit on that uh, later on. Then we have uh, Ludovic Rugetti, who's with the Max Planck Society for Autonomous Systems in Tübingen. And he is going to um, talk about his research for 15 minutes as a start. And then we have Timo Talas from Zen Robotics, who are um, putting the intelligent robots to the practical test in a very, uh, very excellent waste management system. So that's really interesting also because you guys are constantly updating that system actually. So it's going to be interesting to hear from a practical point of view what it means to train a robot. Um, so yeah, without further ado, the way we're going to do it is that uh, Ludovic will start uh, giving us a bit of an insight into his research for 10-15 minutes, I guess. Um, then we'll give um, Timo and Noel some time to respond. And after that, we uh, want to open up to you guys, actually. So yeah, give it up for Ludovic. Right. Thank you. Okay, so I'll just stand because I, I'm not used to talk sitting. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. So um, I'm Ludovic. I'm a scientist. I work at the Max Planck Institute. And maybe let me ask you first a question. So we see a lot of things with uh, phones and, and laptops. So what's the difference between a robot and, and a laptop? Well, there's a lot of difference, but I think the main difference is that a robot is actually able to act on the physical world. It's actually able to do something on the world. It's able to move around. It's able to um, grasp objects and manipulate them and do things with them. And this might sound a little bit obvious, but having robots around and starting to have robots around us uh, might actually change a lot of things about technology and the way we see the world and the way we organize our life. And that's what I do as a research, is try to figure out how you can control the motion of robots and what is the right way of doing that. And one of my dreams is say, how do you do that? How do we make a robot that can do that? So full disclaimer, from now on, all the videos you're going to see are going to be disappointing because robots are not able to do that at all. But that's the goal. How do we do that? And what does it take to be able to do that? And, and that's kind of the research we do. So now, maybe let me try to explain you why this is very difficult and why we are not able to do that uh, with a real system. Uh, one of the big challenge, so let's say you want robots that can do very different things. Huh? You want to have a robot that maybe is going to work on a disaster site scenario, go, going to go and there's a problem and you want to send a robot to see if there are survivors and help people. Maybe you want to have a robot on a construction site to help people to work and, and uh, build, build things around. Maybe you want to have a robot in the kitchen or wherever you want, with, interact with humans, help them and, and do lots of things. And one of the big problems there is that uh, apparently you don't know the world and we don't know the environment and the environment is changing all the time because people are moving around, things are changing all the time. And this is maybe the hardest thing when we do robotics is that we need to have systems that are able to understand the world, make, uh, make um, meaning out of the world and be able to make decisions then out of that to be able to achieve a task. And it sounds a little trivial, but this may be the most difficult question that we try to tackle. The other thing is that you want systems that are versatile. You want systems that are able to do new things. You don't want to program your robot that do one thing, and then what do you do if you want to do something else? You say, oh, I have my robot that can cook, but now I want it to clean my floor, for example. Do I need to buy a new robot? Do I need to download a new app to do that? Or can the robot just figure it out by itself? And that's what we're talking about. Versatility is one of the big, big challenges in what we're doing. And the other thing is that you need to touch the world. And that's what I was saying at the beginning. Touching the world is a huge deal. Because suddenly you might break things. Suddenly you need to make sure that you're not going to hurt someone. And everything that we do when you manipulate an object, you pick up an egg, it's about touching things and applying the right forces. And if you do it wrong, well, you break it. So this is fundamentally important to, to figure out how to do it, and this is very difficult. And at the end, you have full autonomy. We want a robot that is completely able to do everything by itself without anyone telling it anything. And this is, this is very difficult, obviously. So how does it work? So let me quickly show you a little bit the idea. You have a robot, uh, you have sensors, so same thing as on your cell phone. Huh? You collect all your sensors, your cameras, and try to figure out something. The big difference now is that you have motors, and the motors, you need to make decisions. You need to decide how you change the, the current that goes through your motor, such that the robot moves and do something useful. And in the middle, you have all the, the brain, the intelligence, so-called, which nothing is intelligent in the system, let's be clear about that. 
Uh, but typically, this is you do a lot of theory, a lot of algorithmic design, a lot of software. And I'm going to drop two keywords. The one is optimal control, which is what we use to decide what is the best action a robot can do in order to do something useful. And the other one is machine learning, which is going to be given all the data that you collect for the sensors. Can you figure out something useful out of that so the robot can learn something? And now I'm going to show you a bit of the examples that we do. So we have the one of this robot that is a leg robot, and we try to get it to balance. So if you don't try to do that actively, just ask the robot to stand and do nothing. If you push it around, you're going to see that the robot, well, it's not going to balance very well. So now you try to do that actively. And that's what we do, optimal control. So the idea is you compute what is the best thing you can do in order to not fall, given the push. And the robot doesn't know we're going to push it. Maybe more interesting, you can start to put the robot on uh, moving platforms and start to, to shake it around and see how well it does. And now the whole difficulty is that each time something happens, this happens at the millisecond scale, okay? So you need to make decisions a thousand times a second. Uh, you, you try, we try to come up with algorithms that allow you to, to get the robot that is balancing really well. And maybe the, think about this, if you stand on a skateboard and I'm shaking you like this, this is not that obvious if, without taking a step on the side, right? And maybe the most interesting thing, you can start to put the robot on one leg and asking to do different things. So stand on one leg, move your leg, etc., And you can start to push it around and see what happens. And now, all the time, you, you imagine that every second you have a thousand decisions that are made to using all the degrees of freedom of the robot, which is in case you have 70 different motors, 17 different motors that are running. And then you can ask the robot to do various different things. And that's the kind of research we do. We say, what is the way to do that? And what is the best way to do that? You can also do manipulations. We build complete systems where we say, okay, what is the complete software architecture and what is the algorithm that you need to be able to be versatile, to do achieve different tasks? Because if you can grasp an object, you also want to be able to drill, for example, pick up a phone, open a door, etc. So we do a lot of research on how to do that. And, um, and these are examples of the kind of things we can do. So everything is relatively automatized except one level, which is the semantic level, the, way, the level where the robot needs to understand what it actually does. This is usually engineers and a human needs to basically sequence action and say, this is the drill, you need to pick up the drill, then you need to turn it on, and, and then you need to, to, to drill a hole. And this is not something that we are able uh, to, to generate automatically. So there's a lot of research still to be done in order to understand that. But you can see we can, we can do quite cool things, you know, the putting the key in the hole and turning it on, it's actually opening the, the, the door is actually a pretty big deal. So we're making progress. Uh, but we are far, far away from, from full autonomy. Okay. Uh, how do we do that? We have some techniques that are called machine learning. So we use a technique called reinforcement learning, where the idea is that you get the robot to try something, and then through trial and error, it tries to improve what it's actually doing. So here it tries to learn how to open the door. So the way it works, the learning is a big word, okay? What it tries to do is that each time it tries to open the door, it gets a score of how well it did. You know, say, okay, you did well, you did better, you did less good than last time. And given that, the robot tries to figure out what is the next time he's going to, 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 to actually do this motion. And after roughly 20 minutes, the robot is able to learn how to open the door. So you need to learn how to move, and you need to learn how to, what kind of force you need to apply on this handle, and you need to know what is the right coordination to do that. And it works relatively well, so it's, it's nice. But again, this learning here is not this crazy thing that humans are doing. Learning is about finding the right movement to be able to do this thing. So don't let you, don't be fooled by the word learning because learning usually just means figure out, figuring out the right motion. Same thing here after picking up the, the, the pen. So this is a very difficult task. The pen is roughly the size of the finger, so it's very difficult to, to pick up. And you can see that the, the robot after takes also 20 minutes learns, it needs to actually apply a force on the table to be able to pick up the pen. So if you apply too much force, you break the finger. If you not apply enough force or not at the right time, you're not able to pick up the pen. Yeah. And after 20 minutes, you pretty much the robot is able to do to pick up the pen. We've been doing other things. So here it's uh, the it, yeah, oh, sorry. So here the idea is that uh, you know when you walk, you when you do this a repetitive task, you know you know how feel should should feel. You know when you walk, you know that you should feel an impact on your foot, and if it doesn't happen, you know what to do. So here the idea is to get the robot to train to do the same thing. So here the robot uh, picks up an object and learns uh, how it feels, so we record all the sensors on the robot, and the next time it does the, the thing, it, it knows that if something goes wrong, depending on its feelings, uh, its sensors, it can decide what it needs to do. So here the flashlight is going to be 15 centimeters away, so our algorithm is on the right side, 
And you can see that the robot, instead of blindly trying to execute what it needs to do, is able to react and figure out that something's going wrong because it's not what it was expecting to, to, to touch, and is able to adapt its behavior. And this is a, this is a, a close up example of what's going on. So, this is the kind of research that we're looking into and how you do that, how you use machine learning techniques and control techniques to be able to, to get robots to do something useful. Obviously, there's a big gap between what we can do today and this idea of autonomous robots, and I'm not even talking about intelligence because I don't even think that this is something we can do right now. But in the, in the meantime, we're developing tons of technology. Technology to maybe uh, improve the type of constrictions we can do to uh, help in disaster scenarios. Uh, technology to maybe help into household uh, things. Uh, if you understand movement and you understand robotics, you can start to build a prosthetic design, a prosthetic devices to help people. There's lots of application in, in healthcare and uh, education as well. So as we go towards this full autonomy, which is maybe 20, 20, 30 years from now, we actually develop lots of technologies that are you know, up to you to figure out what you can do with that and, and to make you know, things better. It obviously raises a lot of ethical questions and a lot of questions on what kind of world we want to live in. Do we want robots everywhere? Should they be allowed to do everything we want? And I guess it's something we're going to talk about uh, right now. So just to finish, I'm not doing this thing by myself. Robotics is a teamwork, and these are the guys who actually make these things happen. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Timo, maybe we can start with you. Maybe you can uh, elaborate on what intelligent or autonomous or smart robotics mean for your company, Zen Robotics, um, who's doing waste management. And also, um, where you started and where you are now and how you trained the robots. Okay, so um, the company was started in 2007, so quite some time ago. It took some time to, to actually develop the intelligence for, for the robots. Um, we, we, we selected the waste sorting as an application area, since that's an area where you can make mistakes. And when you're making a commercial product using artificial intelligence or machine learning, it's good that you're allowed to do some mistakes. Uh, what is the key is, is that we don't program the robots to do the task, we train the robots and that there are basically two fields where we use. The one is very common to, to what was presented just above. Our robots, they pick objects, from waste objects. So basically the shape and material can be anything. And we use very similar methods that it, it learns through trial and error. It, it tries to pick from one location and it sees whether it um, succeeded or, or failed, and then it tries to repeat the picks that has succeeded before. Another area where we use the training is, is uh, when we train the new material, new object classifiers to the system. So we feed objects to the system. Say we give 1,000 pieces of wood to the system, and we tell these are wood, go figure out what's the difference between wood and stone. So they are trained, not programmed. Um, and when we talk about practical applications of robotics, one thing that I think the broader public always thinks is that, well, the robot's going to take our jobs. Um, can you talk about how robotics changed uh, the way workers work for your company and how it changed the workforce, maybe in the broader context of waste management? Um, my opinion is, is that robots are the next step in the evolution that started already a long time ago when we introduced different kinds of machinery to, to help humans. And at least to this point, uh, those machines haven't replaced people. They have transformed uh, job into an other, other kind of job. When we, when we talk about robots doing the waste sorting, it, it's not the environment that's ideal workplace. There are a lot of uh, dust, there's a lot of dirt, there's a lot of noise. Uh, it's actually it's sometimes pretty dangerous place to work. So, so that's kind of an area where it makes sense to introduce the robots at the first place. And did the criteria for um, your employers change? Because um, the other day I talked to the, um, the Arbeitsamt, the, the, um, what's it, the job center, um, and I think it's a really uh, broad social task, of, uh, a really broad task for society. Um, and they actually have their own task force for um, responding to the robot revolution and what it means for the job market. Um, 
So the, the answers were pretty straightforward and simple, to be honest. More engineers and more informatic students and less, um, well, what, you know, but um, yeah, maybe you can talk about what the require, how the requirements changed for someone to work to, for your company. Um, in, in if, if, if we think our, our engineering team, we of course have a lot of software people, uh, but we have also many people with, with machine uh, learning background, with machine vision background, people who, who understand the sensors, and, and also, since we're doing robots, uh, some hardware people. So, so if, if you compare that to, to a typical engineering company where the difference is its expertise in the machine learning and machine vision. Um, so, Noel, maybe you can uh, talk about um, the sort of task we want to delegate to machines, because I know we talked about that before, and surely waste management is something that sounds really, pleas uh, really pleasant to delegate to machines. Um, but where is, the, where is the line to draw, so to speak? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Well, I, I'm kind of the, the bad guy who, who tells governments and militaries what they shouldn't be doing with robots and the police, so, so I take a sort of negative slant. But I just want to say to start with is that uh, robotics is at a really major turning point at the moment, but as, as <laughs> Ludovic said, and, and he does some of the best robotics work in the world, uh, before robots are going to turn into terminators and take over the world, first of all, they're going to have to learn how to open a door because we're not quite there yet. Okay. And one of, the th one of the big problems in robotics and artificial intelligence, in fact, is managing public expectations because we, we live in a world of science fiction. I love science fiction myself, but it, it pollutes the civil view of what robots are capable of and what they can do. And at present, there are many, many great opportunities for small startup companies with, with the strong innovation to develop all sorts of tasks for robots. And they're being used for many great things at the moment, even monitoring wildlife in Africa to make sure that species that aren't going extinct don't get taken by poachers. We're monitoring under the oceans, looking at the ice cap with autonomous submarine, uh, robot submarines, to look at the melting of the ice caps in a way that humans can't do. So there are many, many ways, great opportunities, but we have to be really, really careful because there are many problems as well. And if we get it wrong, we've got self-driving cars coming online, and Google selling them as, you know, self-driving cars are gonna save many lives on the road. And I think they're probably right, but let's not rush it because we have no evidence for that. So we have to be just a little bit careful before we proceed. And I'm, I'm worried about a lot of aspects of robotics. There are companies rushing ahead now with, my wife and I wrote some papers in 2012 on that. We found 14 companies, for instance, developing robots to look after small children from six months to 18 months old and they were going to do this fairly exclusively. So that was a bit weird. There's robots coming online to look after the elderly, which could also be great if it's assisting them and not keeping them prisoners in the hands of robots. So there's those things. And then we've got the problems with, which I, I'll be talking here tomorrow, doing a talk uh, in this very place at 12.40, which is wrong in all your programs, about the military and civilian human rights issues with robots. So I won't tread on that too much just now. So while those things are, are not good, there are many good things that are coming online, but what they've just touched on here is this idea of unemployment, and that could be absolutely major. Uh, robots were always good at doing dull, dirty, and dangerous tasks. I mean, I've got lots of robots in my house, and I've got one that, that does carpet sweeping very badly. It's not a good sweeper, but it's a great robot, and it works really well, and it navigates really well, but it's pretty rubbish at cleaning as yet. Um, so there's a lot of good progress that can be made there. Um, but, you know, what about jobs like cleaning gutters, washing windows, taking pools? So it's, it's the three Ds of robotics, dull, dirty, and dangerous. And that was what we, where we were going. But now they're be, it's looking as if they're going to start taking white collar jobs. Perhaps they'll take over from journalists, I don't know, like Max here, we talked about it the other day. Yeah. I don't think so. Um, but they will take over a lot of jobs. And, and AI in general is taking over a lot of jobs. I mean, there have been 50,000 jobs lost in New York at the stock exchange 
through computer programs. There's a million jobs going in China, and China, or the Chinese, I, I did a lecture tour there last year, are really concerned about this. There's a million jobs being lost with Foxconn because robots are taking over those jobs. So there's not enough time to go through everything here, but when you're, when you're thinking about making robots, just try and think about what the implications are. You know, where is this going to take us? And, and it's very important now, and it's beginning to happen, and Ludwig's one of these people as well, thinking about the social responsibility, not just building things and thinking, oh, that's okay, the marketplace will take care of it, but social responsibility is vital. Um, Ludwig, maybe you want to respond to that, and maybe we can uh, step back for one second as well, because you're working for the Max Planck Institute, which is a publicly funded organization in Germany, as you probably, most of you are aware of. And what's really interesting in the German discourse especially, I think, but it's something you talked about as well, is that there is this cultural pessimism when it comes to robotics. Um, they're going to take over our jobs, um, they're all going to be killer robots, and don't you feel, and I'm not, not talking about you, but it's a really common, you know, science, and this is something Hollywood loves to, loves to um, utilize, and of course it's been many great movies, but um, isn't it a bit frustrating that it sort of blurs the situation where we really are when we talk about robotics, A, and how we have to respond to that socially, because it's not going to be just duck and cover, obviously, but it's going to need a strategy that needs development, needs a realistic debate. So I think it's a very interesting question. So at Max Planck, we're doing basic research, so we're trying to do things that are going to have an impact within 20 to 30 years from now, not things that have an impact tomorrow. But um, these are real issues, and I think uh, robotics and technology in general is not value-free. If I tell you robots are great and they're going to change your world, I'm making a pretty strong political statement, no? Not everybody would agree with me that robots are great and they're going to improve your life, right? And I think it's important to talk about it and to have an open discussion and not, you know, say, oh, technology is great, you don't have to think about it because we'll take care of it for you. I think this is the wrong approach. I think we need to discuss and I think that's... Uh, I agree with Noel that, that sure, okay, if the dream of automating everything really happens, which it's an if, okay, I have no idea, but if you can really automate everything, maybe we'd have to rethink what unemployment means and what working means because maybe we don't really need to work anymore, no? I mean, if you can produce food and everything we need with machines, who cares about working? I personally, I'm very lazy, I don't like working, so I would love to reduce my working hours. But these are interesting discussions. It doesn't have to be pessimistic. It's say, okay, maybe we can change the world in a different way. It doesn't have to be the same as today. I mean, I guess everybody would agree that the world today is, you know, it's great, but it's not perfect, no? So I think these are good discussions, and usually I very, when I talk with people about um, autonomous weapons as well and things like that, Uh, usually people are interested, they're not pessimistic, they're interested in the debate and they want to be part of it. And I think this is great because we need the civil society to be part of this kind of discussions, yes? Um, as I don't work in, in, in the academic world, my perspective is, is not 20 or 30 years, but more like one or two years. And, and, and that, that partly also explains the, the different views that, that we, we have. And um, for, for, for companies, they develop products um, for, for the near future. And they, for, from the company point of view, what is important that there is this set of rules that, that you need to follow and, and then the companies just follow through the standards or, 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 or regulations. Maybe we can talk about the uh, way innovation happens in robotics because uh, the way innovation happens because actually, um, you know, automation is a process that's been going on for many, many years, obviously, A, and B, it's not something that's, uh, that's the, the sole driver of innovation. Innovation comes from the convergence of other future technologies like biotechnology. We talked about this before, genetics. Um, and where do you see machine learning? Where do you see these? Uh, where do you see robotics in that field of, uh, from a practical point of view, maybe two years, and from a 20, 30 years point of view? <laughs> I, I think there is a lot of going on in the robotics in the different different fields. That uh, that the big trend is is that that we we have those not so intelligent robots, the programmed robots already used in many factories and now we're, we're learning to make more intelligent robots that opens the doors that we can take the robots in, into the different areas. That, that is an opportunity for, for, for many, many startups as was mentioned uh, before. 
uh, and it's, it's, it's really hard to, to say a one specific direction where it goes, but the, the, the coexistence between the robots and humans in the same area, the robots that move around instead of are stationary, uh, robots that learn, uh, those are the trends that I have at least noticed. Yes, I guess, how many people here have a personal drone? Yeah, not, not too many yet. But I think what the robots you're going to see first are in the air. Because all these tasks like moving around, walking, trying to climb stairs and tripping, mostly tripping over. If you have humanoid robots, most of the thing they do is fall. Um, you see, well, it is true, isn't it? You see these fantastic robots on television, humanoid robots, but if you work with them as I've done, you have to have a completely flat level surface that's, you know, very carefully taken. The stairs are each the same size, etc. So it always looks as if we're more advanced than we are. But drones in the air are coming really thick and fast. I have one that I can use, I just use as a camera. And there are a lot of difficulties with that, and there are autonomous ones. I mean, I've seen them being used now for everything, even as far as in Singapore now. There's a bar in Singapore because they can't get any bar staff, so they're actually delivering cocktails. You order your cocktail on the computer, and a little drone delivers your cocktail to you autonomously, and they, they coordinate with each other so that they don't bump into each other, etc. Amazon are now planning all their deliveries by drone. By, they're saying they're going to start by next year, 2016. And my problem with that is not so much that they're doing deliveries, but am I ever going to see the sun again? They're talking about doing millions of deliveries. And where are all these devices going to go? That's what gets me. They're being used for, there's plans to use them for everything. And they will be fully autonomous, so they are robots. And I, I have no idea what's going to happen there. But it's going to happen very soon and very quickly and keep on happening. As far as 30 years is concerned, um, the future isn't my period, and the one thing that we're really good at in artificial intelligence and robotics is making false predictions. We've been doing that since the 1950s, and, and I think we're really rather excellent. We should pat ourselves on the back for having made more false predictions than anybody else on the planet. Um, yes, please go ahead. Oh, yeah, I would agree with no, the making predict predicting the future is, is uh, usually you. Recipe for failure. So, you know, in the 70s, people thought we were going to have flying cars. I mean, I don't see a single flying car, but I have a cell phone. Nobody predicted that. Um, yeah, so I don't know, but uh, I think what is exciting is that we are starting to scrap the surface on uh, understanding what autonomy is and what does it mean to have machines that can make decisions. And, and from an intellectual point of view, this is very exciting to try to understand because it also tells us a little bit about ourselves, you know, what, what are we as machines, I mean, humans, but, you know, biological machines that, that, uh, that make decisions and that they are able to do things and learn new skills. And it's, I think that uh, in terms of understanding you know, the world, this is, this is very exciting. In terms of technology, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that can be applied to, to clearly make you know, the life of a lot of people better. Uh, but yeah, difficult to predict how it's going to look like in 30 years. Um, I think we have about six, seven minutes time, so I would like to open up the discussion to you guys. And I'm sure you have some questions about how the machines, how the man should machine to uh, react to the machines. Um, maybe you can. I'm just going to come down here and. Yes. Uh, regarding the comments about uh, the future, and I particularly agree with the fact that there's a lot of false predictions, but I wanted to hear your uh, opinions on the technological singularity, particularly uh, as state of Werner Vinge and that whole area. Should I, should I start? So I'm going to make, I'm going to make a strong statement. Um, I think it makes absolutely no sense to talk about that. I think artificial intelligence, the word intelligence is a problem because anything that works in a machine is not intelligent, okay? A machine, it does what the algorithm tells it to do. So everything is pre-programmed and there's clearly steps in what it follows. If you're, um, whatever thing, device that you use that is intelligent because it can recognize that you have a cat on a picture or things like that and the robot is able to learn how to open a door, cannot do anything else. It, you say, okay, now, you know, you have a robot that can play chess, say, can you play some, another game? It cannot. Uh, have a robot can open a door, can it um, do something else? It cannot. 
uh, I think we have to be very careful into mixing science fiction and what reality is. And reality is that we are far away from anything close to intelligent. Maybe it will happen, again, I don't want to predict the future, but I think there's no point of talking about things that most likely will not happen, or at least it's in the very far future, because it, dis it distracts us from the real problems, which are you know, not so intelligent machines that are actually having an impact on the real world. That's maybe, I would say, that's, that's the thing that I find maybe most frightening from that point of view. I, I would ag agree with Ludovic, but I couldn't really say what would happen in 100 or 1,000 years' time. And we don't know how technologies will combine, what biological things will be added to machines or whatever. But I, I think that the timelines that have been given are absurd, really, quite, I, I would say so. Um, but I think that it, it's not really something that really concerns me, but, but the full automation really concerns me as to what controls we're going to cede to machines. And they don't have to be like us. They could just be machines at the border that say, yes, you can enter, no, you can't enter. And it would be, they could be more like a sort of answer phone machine that you get when you call someone that's really, really irritating. And if you read, a really good science fiction, fiction writer to read is Daniel Suarez, who's written a book called The Kill Decision and a book called Demon. And he explains how machines, robots, take over the world but they're really stupid. And that, that's more frightening to me because when they ask someone a question and someone answers, they say, I'm sorry, can you just answer yes or no because I can't understand language. But they still manage to take over, so it's worth, worth looking at. So in the machine learning context, right, so the, the, the problem with robots historically has always been that evil people would program them right, in some ways, but in the machine learning context, there's more fluidity to that environment. So, you know, in your example, if a robot is opening a door, what if it confuses a human for a door, and does it try to open a human 70 times before it realizes it's not a door? And um, I guess, you know, machine learning is about trial and error. Um, do you kill 70 people before you realize you shouldn't kill them? Or how do you actually introduce conscience in a, an environment where it's actually a feedback loop? If, if I provide a simple answer in our case, we, we bolted the robots to the floor and we built a cage around. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think if I got you correct, what you just referred to is the, the case that happened a couple of weeks ago in the uh, uh, Volkswagen um, factory. Um, we don't know a lot of details, so it's a lot of speculation about that, but uh, maybe you can touch on the security measures that... Um, I don't know any details of, of that, that case, so I, I cannot comment directly to that. Uh, but in, in our case, as with, with the traditional robots, there are several safety measures that, that, that you build into the system. Uh, but of course, sometimes humans are intelligent enough to go around or, or not knowledgeable enough about the, all the things that happen there. So, so, yeah, unfortunately, there is learning through errors and, and, and terrible accidents like that. And what is important is, is that we do learn from those and, and we, we analyze what went wrong and how we can make the system more, more safe and secure. Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. I mean, that all these questions related to how much intelligence, or at least uh, this power to making decisions to a robot you give is, is a good... Um, I think we need to think about, uh, there's, there's a whole field of, in engineering called verification, where you need to be able to give guarantees when you have a robot or a machine, like a plane that is running, you need to be able to prove that under normal circumstances it's not going to crash. And in robotics we don't have, at least we have this in industrial robotics, I mean you, you know more than me, but we don't have so much into, for the robots that go let, into the real world. And this is, a, this is a, an open field of, of research and we, we need to come up with, with uh, guidelines to do that. And, and it's, a, it's a real, yeah, it could become a problem if we don't think about it ahead before, before you know, robots are ahead. Can you maybe elaborate on the shift of power um, by technology use? 
uh, for example, there was this ch um, very famous chess game between Kasparov and someone else. And the first time Kasparov was, was like winning three times in a row, and the second time, as soon as they were able to use like chess computing software, uh, there was power shift. So I'm like quite interested in how the social material entity of like a human cyborg is going to like uh, be affected by technology changes and how the uh, shift of power is going to change our future. So, so I, I uh, okay. Um, okay, it's difficult. I, I cannot answer this question very well, I guess, but let's ask a question. Uh, did Kasparov lost again the computer or did he lost again 100 engineers from IBM? I, I mean, maybe I'm very skeptical, but uh, I think I think that, that I think we we can still put boundaries on on, uh, on what's happening, and and, uh, and usually everything that the robot that the machine does, I mean, whether it's a robot or a computer, uh, we, the human knows what to expect from it and knows knows uh, what what kind of boundaries you can actually put on this. Uh, but yeah, I, I I don't know how to answer. I, can I just say something about that? Because I think that. That was, for me, working in AI at the time, Kasparov lo losing to Deep Blue was, was an extraordinary achievement. That was massive because right back in the early 70s, everybody talked about a horizon effect that there would never, computers might beat the odd grandmaster but never become champions. And that was quite an astonishing achievement. But really, when you think about it, though, uh, the, what, why we thought that in the 70s was because we didn't realize the super speed of the machines and that be able to use, do 10 million searches a second. And that was one of the, one of the big problems with it. Uh, we didn't think that. But chess is a very, very closed game. It's not like the real world. It's a very closed game. And the reason why humans are intelligent who play chess, I mean, it requires a great deal of human intelligence and advanced pattern recognition, simply because we have such limited memories. So we have to use advanced pattern recognition, something that can search millions of moves ahead is a whole other matter. And it's like saying to me, would you like to arm wrestle with one of those great big diggers in the road and then say, you know, a machine beat me. So it used brute force there rather than intelligence. That's one of the things. And that is, that is not demonstrate, it's still a good thing for machines. That's the way it goes. And it's the same with uh, Watson who won at Jeopardy recently, brilliant piece of work. Uh, but again, brute force search, and it's now being used in the medical domain very well. So, so that's very good as well. But, but I wouldn't get carried away with the results in the general way. So one last question, and then, um, yes, we'll be happy to chat to you guys afterwards, I guess. Then we've got to go for after one last question. Uh, Please. In, in your presentation, you showed us a lot of humanoid robots. And I was wondering if that's because you think that's the future going towards things like cyborgs, or are you also re researching non-humanoid robots? Because I think that m something like opening doors might be easier with some other tool than a hand. And there are things like climbing stairs that could use work better with something else than feet. So I was wondering if you're doing research into that area as well, since it's more of the beaten path. Oh, this is the excellent question. No, um, yeah, I, I only showed that. I just realized I only showed humanoids. Uh, we, we do, uh, uh, because we bought one, and uh, uh, we do research on, so all the technologies we show is, is usually can be used by any robots with legs and arms. So we do work on quadrupeds, on any types of things. And obviously, you know, maybe the humanoid form is not, it's, in, it's kind of interesting to work with. It's very difficult to, to walk. Uh, so it's a very challenging thing. Is it the best thing to use for many applications? I don't think so. Yeah, you're right. There's a lot of, for a specific application, if you understand the application, you understand the requirements of the application, you can fine tune what you do and you don't need to have a general form. That's de definitely. The technology we develop is, is, um, is general enough that it can be applied to any types, at least there's a hope that it can be to any types of, 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 of robotic systems, yes. Okay, um, unfortunately, we got to wrap up and um, give the stage to everyone else. Thanks for listening. Thank all you three, all three of you for being here. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.